Um, so let me introduce our speaker who is Onis Bolton. He has a PhD. Um, he started his education at the University of Michigan where he earned his Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering. He was hired by Pacific Industrial Development Corporation or PIDC out of college where he was a product development engineer for about four years. Onis then returned to the University of Michigan to earn his PhD in Materials Science and Engineering where he worked with Dr. Kim. Shortly after, Onis made the move from the engineering campus down to central campus um, at U Michigan uh, to join Dr. Adam Masker as a postdoctoral researcher. That's when I met Onis. I was a graduate student while Onis was a postdoc and we were kind of adjacent labs. Um, let's see, oh, I lost my place. Okay, as a postdoc, uh, his work was patented and featured in CNE News, um, in Popular Mechanics and in The Economist. Uh, so already making some some waves there. In 2013, Onus went to Autotech in Cleveland, Ohio, where he was a research scientist resulting in three more patents. Uh, after about another four years, Onus launched out with Octet Scientific as the CEO and founder. This was in 2017. Um, I'm sure we'll be hearing more details about all of the science that's going on there. Um, in addition to all of that, Onus is a father of three and he has bragging rights that he has served ice cream on two non-consecutive occasions to the legend Tom Brady. With that, hey. hand yes. it over. I, I worked, you know, if, if any of you have like college jobs that you think are just jobs, you know, you're doing to get paid. I worked at an ice cream place in Ann Arbor called Stoochies when I was an undergraduate. And twice, Tom Brady, the starting quarterback in college at the time in Michigan, came in all by himself, not a friend in the world, he bought waffle cone with three scoops, the biggest ice cream we have. Um, and I thought, man, that poor guy, he's a starting quarterback of our football team. And he comes in on a Saturday night all by himself, you know, buying ice cream. So that's that's why I feel so bad for him. Um, let me share my screen. OK, you see it? Yep, looking good. Okay, so I kind of threw this together, you know, starting from, we'll get into a bit of what my company does, um, but also just kind of the, the complex way that one would start a chemistry-based company, startup company, for those of you who might be interested in that. Um, so it's probably gonna be a little bit lighter on science, you know, than some of the talks you normally have in a seminar, uh, in an academic setting, but hopefully, um, You'll find it interesting. I think we're kind of in a unique place as chemists uh, in the world. It's something that's so very important to everything we do in our daily lives, but also kind of in the background of a lot of people's lives too. So I titled my talk, So You Want to Start a Chemical Company. Now, right off the bat, probably a lot of people will say, no, of course not, that's way too risky. Why would you want to start a chemical company? It'd be a lot easier to go work for a big established chemical company um, where you can apply your, your skills you know, every day and have a much easier life. And that's, that's great, that's fine. You know, this is just a talk to the people who, who say what I've written down here small yet, but what, what if it works? What if you could find something new? What if you really wanted to change the world personally with the chemistry that you've made? So the talk is basically broken into three parts. First of all, how, how to start a chemical company. And then I'll tell you about how I started my company and what my company does. And then I thought I'd throw in a little extra thing, just how to succeed in life. So that's at the end. So first of all, how to start a chemical company. You will need a number of things, and I think this is where it's really tricky. Um, startups are really popular these days. I think we all know all the big name unicorn startups that are in the news. Chemistry startups can be a bit different. You know, you have a lot more overhead to consider than, say, uh, an Uber or a Facebook or any sort of software based company where you just need computers to get started. Um, you have to plan a similar kind of business model, but at the same time, be aware that you're making a chemical at some point and you're going to have to scale it up. It's a physical product. Um, it has a lot more regulatory oversight that you have to consider. It's a lot more complex. But in general, the things you'll need to build a company are, first of all, a product that somebody wants and somebody's willing to pay for, a product that can be profitable and scalable, so something that you could actually 
make enough money to build a company on, a product you can actually make, and I, I, I italicize the you because it has to be something that you can imagine yourself making. We can all dream up chemicals that would be awesome, you know, but, but couldn't they, could you actually make them or could you build a factory to make them? And you'll need some sort of competitive advantage, some sort of why you kind of question to be answered here. Like, what do you know that nobody else does? How can you make this idea into a protectable, kind of repeatable business? And I want to highlight the most important one of those, which is the top one. The most important thing you need, a product somebody wants. I, statistics vary, but I've seen 60 to 90% of all startup companies fail because you're developing some sort of super cool thing that nobody really wants or that no one's willing to pay good money for. Um, that, that as cool as it is, as, as impressive as the science may be, you know, as, as world changing as you think it could be, nobody really wants this product. It's not answering any sort of a real world thing. So how do you know if you have a product that somebody wants? Well, there's only so many reasons why someone's going to want the product. It saves them money, it makes their life easier, and it's worth the effort to actually make the switch or to start adopting your product. Um, there are plenty of things, you know, anecdotally, you can hear stories about uh, somebody having some sort of product that is an, a definite improvement over something that exists already. Um, but if the thing that exists already is working okay, and to make the switch would, would be costly, people won't make the switch. So off the top of my head, the metric system. You know, here in the US, the metric system is hands down better than the English imperial whatever system. No one can argue that. It's impossible. They can't do it. But here we are, you know, decades after the most recent effort to try to switch the US to the metric system, and we're stuck with it because as as clunky as it is, as difficult as it is, it works. It works okay. And to make the switch would be really costly, and there are forces at play to prevent those costs. So we're measuring things in inches and gallons and converting things when we talk to the smarter world. So just because an idea is better doesn't mean it's going to win out if no one's willing to pay to make the switch. And the way you can know, the most critical thing you can do if you have some really cool idea for a new chemical or new, any, any product, any new product, is talk to the people who would be buying this the customers, you know, the potential customers. And when I say talk to them, I really mean listen to them. Um, when you, this is called customer discovery. So you have an idea, you have to get out there and talk to the people who might be buying it to see if the thing you're going to improve really matters to them, if it's really worth what it would take to switch to your new product. This is a really critical point that's becoming more and more of a centerpiece in the government's um, startup efforts. I'll talk about the National Science Foundation quite a bit because they funded my company. It's the first thing they make you do is go through these, these I-Core boot camp kind of things where they say, talk to the customers. Are they willing, even before the science works? If it did work, was, is anyone gonna wanna buy this? Would they, how, how enthusiastic would they be to make this switch? You need to listen to customers, you need to talk to a lot of them. You need a statistical sample that tells you if people really want this, 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 could, be, this could be something that works. Then of course, if you've got an idea that people would be willing to pay for, it would solve some big problem, can you base a business off of this? Is it, is it gonna be a profitable product and can it be scalable? So I have here kind of a, a shotgunning of questions. You know, the, the short thing, can you sell it for more than, you, than it costs to make it? You know, is, is it a profitable product? And then, okay, well, can you do it on scale? Can you make it big enough you know, to, to serve the market that you're going after, to make as many of them as you need to make? To support a business. Do you have a realistic idea of what the customers are willing to pay for it? You might say, hey, hey I can make this chemical, let's say, and I can charge them a million dollars a gram because it's so awesome. And then all your financial models work out. Yeah, you're going to be a millionaire, but no one's going to pay that much. You know, how realistic are your targets there? How, how have you valued your product in the real world? Um, and are you sure you can make it as cheap as you think? There's a lot of unknowns, you know, until you start scaling up. And then I just have some kind of snarky questions here. Oh yeah, what about warehousing, shipping, the EPA, FDA, patent costs? Chemicals are expensive. You know, the good side is once you've invented a new chemical that is very valuable and changes something worth money, 
it's 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 strong IP, it's strong intellectual property. You can patent it, you can have a process for making it. It's not as fluid as say computer code or something that can change hands really easily and is easy to take apart. Um, but to get there, you need to make sure the EPA is cool with it. If it's a medical or food product, you gotta make sure the FDA is cool with it, which requires testing, which requires money. And then you gotta pay for those patents too. So it's complex. In the background of the slide, I have like a, a piping and instrumentation diagram sort of a thing to kind of remind us how complex that can be. But it was too big of a graphic for me to squeeze in the margins. So that goes to show you how complex it is. And then can you execute this idea? Um, you know, can this be realistically done with a one person team, two person team, startup? Um, do you have an idea that's going to require you to suddenly have the product power of Dow Chemical or somebody? Yeah, we can change the world after we've already conquered the world. You know, that, that's going to be difficult. Can you get the resources you'll need to get it started? You know, will you have to be raising millions of dollars to get this thing started or can it be done at an easier level? And then once you start showing the world what an awesome product you have, um, how necessary it's been all this while, how do you protect that? You know, what is your, they call it, unfair advantage? Why are you, why are you, particularly you, the one to bring this to the market? Either timing, you had the idea first. You know, that's, that's the way almost every software-based company works. Um, were you there in time to make the first patent? Did you get the best thing locked down so that you own it? Or do you have some sort of unique skill set or knowledge that's going to keep you in front of your competitors as you start to see the success? And so yet, yeah, what I'm asking for, or what the world is asking for here, is, is difficult. I often think of it like, you know, you're, you're, you're in hockey, you're playing hockey, and you're trying to make like a blue line goal. You're shooting it from the, near the middle of the ice, and there's a lot of people in the way. And the way that your puck gets in is gonna, it's difficult. You have to dodge a lot of possible pitfalls, a lot of blocks, um, but that's just kind of how it is. If you can plan something that kind of checks all these boxes, answers all of these questions, then you might really have something. And you'll probably be able to convince someone at some level to put some money behind the idea and get started. But there's a lot of planning that goes into place before you get there. So it's difficult. That's why I said in the, the tagline for the presentation that it's, it's kind of won and lost in the planning. You have to be really honest and think, well, could this work? You know, sure there's gonna be some unknowns, but can this work? So from someone who is not even necessarily all the way there, you know, we're, we're still a very young startup. So this isn't wise words from someone who's gotten all the way to the top of the mountain. But from what I've seen so far, my advice would be, first of all, be extremely honest and emotionless. If you're looking at any sort of business idea or idea that you've had, um, a lot of people think their ideas are awesome and they sometimes uh, fail to see the possible shortcomings or be honest about um, what could go wrong, what people are willing to pay for it, how much it will cost to make. Don't rely on brute force. So I mean, don't tell yourself you're just going to work hard and that's going to solve problems. I mean, there, there are problems that no amount of work can fix. You're, you're going to work hard no matter what if you start your own company. But don't think we'll outmaneuver our competition by just making more phone calls everybody can make phone calls. If it was as easy as that, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of random chance who's going to win. <clears throat> um, you know, but you do need to understand that you're not going to have all the answers. I mean, we certainly don't at Octet. Um, but you have to have kind of a plan for those unknowns. You need to stay flexible. Um, you need to stay practical. You know, so what's going to get you to where you need to be the fastest? What's going to get you to revenue? What's going to make things work? You know, what things can you sacrifice? What things can you can you not? Um, don't be shy. You know, you need to talk to a lot of people. You need to get your ideas out there. You need to be kind of brave about a situation like this. So, do it. I, I, the last bullet: don't be reckless, but <laughs> embrace the suck. You know, you're going to be bad. You're not going to have all the answers. You're going to be a small team. It's going to be kind of embarrassing in some ways that you you know. For me to talk to somebody at a large chemical company, you know, you feel like an imposter. You know, you feel like a, a clown in some ways. You're like, oh, you're just a, a kid with an idea kind of a thing, talking to these big established people. But you'll find if you have the idea, if you know what you're talking about, then you've got something. You know, ideas are, are only owned by large companies. In fact, they're generally more owned by smaller companies. Um, so you just need to kind of embrace your shortcomings and be, be 
shameless, be brave about making conversations and trying to, trying to sell your idea and, and build it. So with that, I'll tell you about how I started my chemical company. My background, um, I went to, I got a bachelor's degree from chemical engineering, as, as uh, Professor Gerlach said. Did everything in Michigan, and then after my PhD and postdoc, I went to work for a company called Atotech. Now, when I was in grad school, I worked on organic LEDs, I worked on biosensors, and my postdoc, I worked on explosives. So crazy stuff, fun stuff to talk about, especially the explosives. Uh, but then I made a total change when I went to Atotech. I was a, a trailing spouse. I was looking for work, you know, in Cleveland, an opportunity to work on a college campus at a small research team of Atotech came up. Cool, so I took it. And I was doing organic chemistry, which is my strongest skill set, I'd say. And it was electroplating. So we were making additives to control the way circuit boards are built by how the copper gets deposited. So a total departure from anything I've done before. So there, I learned a lot about um, electroplating and the, the important role that organic compounds actually play in putting metal on surfaces and how these tiny little secret ingredient additives we would drop into a gigantic plating bath would actually control whether the copper stuck or not and where it went. So they had immense, immense control over the most critical part of the step, you know, most, most critical part of the manufacture of these metalized parts, but they were a tiny, tiny component. That company underwent some restructuring and my, uh, my position moved to Berlin, Germany, where my boss actually sat. It was a very nice offer, but I decided to stay in the US with my family and looked for um, other opportunities. A friend of mine suggested that I think about starting my own business through the National Science Foundations um, or other agencies, but the, the SBIR, Small Business um, for Innovative Research Grants. And these are money for ideas. It's a really, really wonderful program I'll talk more about later um, that the National Science Foundation does to found or to support companies, founders, as they try to commercialize ideas based on science. So for several months, I did literature reviews, um, patent searches, and familiarized myself with the battery industry uh, because the same friend who recommended I did this had done some work on zinc battery additives. And through that research, I came up with the idea for the company, which I'll get into later, but it was another total departure. I had done electroplating work, so I had worked with additives for that but I had never done anything with batteries. I'll tell you very, very honestly, I didn't know what was inside batteries. I had seen the, you know, I know there's two cells, yeah, electrons go back and forth. Yeah, 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 I got it. But I really didn't know much about what was inside most of batteries. I mean, it was really a big change in, uh, in field for me, though I did fundamentally understand the metal plating that goes, place, goes on inside uh, most metal-based batteries. So this is kind of my, my walk through the fields I've worked in before. So we wrote a proposal for phase one, STTR. Um, these are some of the graphics from that proposal. And this is Professor Rohan Akolkar. He was the co-PI on our first grant and he's the, the friend I mentioned at Case. He had done a little bit of work, published a few papers looking at zinc batteries and additives for them. And these are, I know this is really wordy, these are just the actual graphics out of that proposal just to show you kind of how they look. Our idea was, I must use my mouse here, um, zinc air batteries have potential to have a lot more energy density than even lithium ion. But the problem is zinc air is not rechargeable because you get dendrite growth when you try to recharge a zinc based battery. I'll talk more about dendrites later. Uh, but Rohan had done some work looking at polyethylene glycol, PEG, and polyethylene amine as potential additives you can put into these batteries to stop the metal from growing in, in needle shapes and keeping it smooth. And the basic thrust of the research that I, well, my interpretation was that PEG works okay, but it's weak. PEI works excellent, but it's way too strong. And it kind of stops all the zinc from going down. So you can stop dendrites a little bit and get fine performance from the battery. You can stop dendrites entirely and get bad performance from the battery. Our idea was to explore this molecular space and develop something that kind of had features of both to strike that sweet spot where you can stop dendrites so you can make your zinc air rechargeable um, without sacrificing a lot of performance by shutting the whole thing down like PEI does. And we won the grant. 
I mean, skipping over a lot here, we, we wrote the grant, we submitted it, we waited several months, and we won. And so with the money coming in, we had to find a lab, which is difficult. We had to uh, basically set up a company. Uh, we weren't expecting to win the first grant we submitted, but uh, fortune smiled. So we got the money from the grant, and that's always the first step, was where, how are you going to fund this company? And you know, to the, the NSF prides itself on this, it, it says that over 60% of the grants it funds are for first time applicants. Um, it's really an excellent program. I can't say enough good things about it uh, for, for funding early stage research with commercial opportunity. We looked to our local ecosystem to see who can help us um, start a company. Uh, we needed, of course, space to actually start doing the research and um, just general advice on, on building a business. So fortunately here in Ohio, we have Bright Energy Innovations, which is a, an energy-based business incubator based out of Warren, Ohio. Um, it was really just kind of taking shape at the same time we were. Um, and there are several in Cleveland, including Magnet, Manufacturing, Advocacy, and Growth Network, um, which is actually where I'm speaking to you from today. That's, that's the building we're, we're working in. They had some hood space. They actually had a, some chemistry and chemical lab space that we could, we could rent. Um, so we needed facilities, we needed guidance. We found that from our local ecosystem and that basically set the stage for Octet Scientific. So back then, we were focusing on zinc-based batteries. And well, I should say we were focusing mainly on, on zinc air when we got started. So again, this is really wordy. This is more just to show you what our pitch decks looked like back then <clears throat> and kind of show you the evolution of the company. At the time we said, batteries are a big bottleneck. We need smaller, safer, uh, more compact batteries. Um, that's what's holding back a lot of technology. It's really the big, the, the big stumbling block of future devices. And zinc air could be that battery because zinc is really ideal for energy storage. It's the original battery, the voltaic pile was zinc copper. Um, zinc is safe, recyclable, energy dense, cheap. It's not flammable because the batteries are water-based. Um, it's recyclable because zinc is already recycled in large amounts in the U.S. already. Um, it's energy dense. Zinc air can be, could be much more energy dense than lithium ion, and, and zinc is also very cheap. A lot of people are surprised to know that um, AA batteries, AAA batteries, those are zinc batteries. Hearing aid batteries, like these little buttons, those are zinc-based batteries. Zinc has been around for a long time. It's really dominant in a lot of the battery markets, but all those markets are non-rechargeable. So zinc has been this you know, unimpeachable hero when it comes to uh, single-use batteries because it drains well, it's cheap, it's safe, it's easy to handle, but it hasn't been able to cross over to recyclability, I'm sorry, rechargeability um, because of the dendrite problem. And that's really what's been holding it back, is that zinc is hard to recharge. You know, it's winning in the non-rechargeable space, but totally on the sidelines of recharging. And here are the dendrites I was talking about. Uh, this is what happens when you try to recharge a zinc-based battery. You go from a nice smooth piece of zinc, this is a, a zinc surface on the upper left here, and as you charge it, you get these crazy forests of needles and spikes, and these are the dendrites, dendritic growth on zinc as you plate it. We decided, well, our, our idea was to develop chemistry, chemistry chemicals uh, to solve this problem, and I'll get more into this later too. But we developed these chemicals, we called them octolite. And down below you can see this. So this is from our pitch decks, it's very light on the sides. With our compound in place, you can see we don't have any dendrite growth. But we do have a fair amount of, of bubbles, but that's a secondary issue. Um, so we developed a chemical that would stop dendrite growth in zinc-based batteries. So now zinc can be recharged many, many times, and zinc-based batteries can be easily reused. The problem with this was that zinc air batteries, which were kind of our calling card in our first phase, are really quite a ways away from commercialization. It turns out that the dendrite problem is one of the big problems, but it's certainly not the only one. Um, there's problems with the air cathode, there's problems with just the reversibility of the reaction that takes place in a zinc air battery. Zinc air was probably 10 years or more from being a real commercial product. But the good news was people were doing zinc for other things too in different zinc chemistries. And one of the big, big opportunities that's about to explode worldwide is grid storage. So these are the big batteries that are going to soak up all the juice from the wind and the solar and even from the excess other sorts of power sources on the grid when we have excess power, store it up 
and dispense it later. So it's been cited as a real key component to our eventual switch to an all renewable power grid. We need somewhere to store the energy. And so this is oncoming. I mean, this is happening now. Back then it was only two to three years away. And you see all the time forecasts like this, where it's just gonna go up and up and up and up and up. It's forecast to be a over $600 billion opportunity in the next 20 years. So people were working on zinc for this application too. And they're having some of the same problems uh, with dendrite growth, with plating inside their batteries. So where is Octet today? Well, we have a new phase one grant. Um, our zinc air phase one did not get to phase two, uh, largely because of those challenges with zinc air, but we pivoted into grid scale energy storage, strictly speaking, zinc bromine. So as I said, grid storage is a huge opportunity. $640 billion of investment between now and 2040 is one of the biggest forecasts I see from Bloomberg. And we think there's a real big opportunity for zinc because lithium ion is really not right for this application. Um, I don't know how much you might know, but there have been a couple of very high profile battery fires with lithium ion installations. There was a big one in Arizona that sent eight uh, fire people to the uh, hospital. Um, turned out to be one bad cell, setting off thousands of bad cells, eventually thermal runaway. There was a fire in Liverpool, South Korea. Um, there's also challenges with the supply chain with lithium ion. Lithium ion is absolutely going to be the, the hero technology that gets us off combustion engines. There's no doubt. Nothing is as dense as that. But for grid storage, it's got a lot of problems. And what does grid storage really need? Well, if you look at the columns in this graphic, you need good cost. You know, this, this is just storing the energy. You want to add as little cost as possible. The Department of Energy recently put out a target for five cents per kilowatt hour stored is the target. So it's got to be very, very cheap to store the energy. Of course, it needs to be safe because we're talking about huge batteries. You know, and not just out in the field somewhere next to a wind farm, but also in New York City or places where there's a dense population. So we need to be able to store that energy in a way that's not compromising safety. Duration, it needs to run for a long time. You know, we need a battery that can drain overnight where solar is used as energy or when it's not windy, where wind is used. Um, you know, we're looking at something that can do eight hours or more. So relatively big style batteries. Supply chain is also a recent focus. Well, it was of the, the last administration, but also the Biden administration and the Department of Energy really, really focused on having a domestic supply chain. Um, and then, of course, performance, which I've just kind of shorthanded as efficiency. The batteries need to perform well. You know, we need to make sure that they're efficient like everything else in the future. So if you look across, and you've probably been looking at these big red X's already, lithium-ion doesn't really check almost any of those boxes. Even though lithium-ion batteries have gotten cheaper and cheaper, they're still not nearly as cheap as other battery technologies when you're talking about large scale. Safety, I've already mentioned the fires. Duration, lithium-ion, again, is not really ideal for large scale. Supply chain is kind of a war we've already lost. Uh, Asia Pacific does 80%, I think, I think China specifically does 80% of the world's lithium ion battery production. Um, so there's either a lot of work to be done to catch up or you know, we need to look somewhere else. But performance is good. Lithium ion batteries perform really, really well. But when you look across that, you see, ah, why are we using this for the grid? Why would we put this uh, you know, in large formats? I, I say, I usually tell this, this sound like story that lithium ion was designed to be compact and it was designed for cell phones and laptops and power tools and it worked and we said okay cool now maybe we can squish 7,000 cell phone batteries together and drive a car and hey yeah you need compact power for a car it's got to be as light as possible for the energy so we can make electric cars with 7,000 cell phone batteries squished together you know there's challenges i mean there have been fires um, they're still not cheap enough to compete with combustion engine cars, but they're getting there. But now we talk about, okay, let's squish a million of these batteries together to power the grid. And I feel like that's, that's where we're starting to cross a line because the grid doesn't care how small the battery is. The grid just wants it to be cheap, safe, long lasting, and something that ideally we can make locally and recycle and be sustainable. It doesn't need to be tiny like lithium ion and all those other applications. So people look at other things like lead acid. The second row down there. Lead acid is, is definitely cheap. Um, safety is not great. It's based on lead. Uh, duration is also not very good. They, they don't have a very long cycle life, really. 300, 400 cycles, you know, it starts to, starts to lose capacity. 
supply chain is great. We make, you know, we have great uh, manufacturing in the, in the U.S. Efficiency is not so good. Vanadium or other kinds of flow batteries, um, cost is also not ideal. Like the price of vanadium in, in particular has gone up a lot. Safety can also be challenging. Uh, vanadium is toxic. Um, they're complex. You know, there's a lot of moving parts. Duration is great with a flow battery. You just make the tanks bigger, so that's that's a check in its, in its favor. Supply chain, largely because of the vanadium, is also a question, and efficiency is is not as good. But as you might suspect, down here at the bottom is our favorite, which is zinc. Zinc is very very cheap. Uh, zinc is very very safe. Uh, we literally, I think the statistic is, every the average person has the average adult has between three or four grams of zinc in their body at any given time. I think only iron is in greater supply in your body in terms of metals. Very safe, environmentally benign. Duration is good. These batteries can easily be scaled to 8, 12 hours. Uh, supply chain is also very good because we mine zinc in the US. Zinc is everywhere. It's easy to handle. But efficiency is not as good as lithium ion. Uh, and this is because of those problems I mentioned before. Um, so anyway, I kind of already gone over this, but all the different possible benefits for zinc, it's plentiful, it's cheap, it's sustainable, it's domestic. It's also very versatile, not just grid batteries, but also all the AA, AAAs we make, um, lead acid replacement with nickel, uh, nickel zinc is a big opportunity. People are working on zinc for other applications beyond grid storage. It's just mainly what we're focusing on because of the big commercial opportunity. And zinc is starting to take root. There are a number of companies who are working on developing starting to commercialize uh, zinc-based batteries for all those different applications. So a smattering of headlines here. It's obviously a beautiful technology on paper because it's you know, safe, cheap, domestic. Um, but we need to get the performance up so it can compete with the incumbent technologies. And again, it goes back to dendrites. Dendrites, bad plating, these problems that happen when you really recharge the battery. And a different picture here, you can see dendrites are forming in this zinc anode. And this Contributes to a lot of things. Batteries are complex, but in general, it lowers the efficiency, can reduce the capacity, can shorten the battery lifetime. It hurts the performance to the point where it falls fairly you know, significantly far behind a lithium ion, which headlines at 95% efficiency. So it's all based on problems with the plating. So we developed new additive chemistries, novel molecules that work in small quantity inside the battery to stop dendrite growth. Um, I'll get into it next. We can get a little science here in the next couple slides. Um, so it's an elegant solution. You know, you, you literally would just drop our chemical into the battery, mix it in with the electrolyte, which is already the liquid part of the battery. And you can increase the efficiency up, up to 15%. Efficiency is a complex number, but that's where we're targeting. You can extend the battery life with, with more cycles, 50%, some, sometimes maybe 100. Uh, it's a drop-in solution with no sacrifices. You, you literally just add it to the electrolyte. It's, Often say it's a literal drop-in solution. You add one weight percent to the electrolyte, you know, and you see these benefits. So easy to implement, brings big value, a simple sort of thing to add to the supply chain, a beautiful solution to dendrites, making efficiency better, making these batteries the hands-down best choice for places like grid storage and stationary power. Okay, so we get a little science in. Not too much. But what is a dendrite exactly? Well, imagine you're looking at a zinc surface. This is the surface of the metal. Inevitably, somewhere in the metal is going to be a little bit higher than the others. Maybe, maybe only an atom or two higher. But when you're plating, you're taking the dissolved zinc ions, which are salts at that, that time, and converting them back into the zinc metal. Now, wherever it's a little bit higher, it's going to have a diffusional advantage over the rest of the, the surface. It's a little bit further out there. So as these atoms start to flow down, they're a little bit more likely to find one of these tips. Also, the electric field is going to be quite strong there. There are other, there are other things at play, but you know, in simplest terms, it catches them first. And this kind of runs away because now you're starting to grow kind of an antenna. That one makes the tip a little bit bigger. And so the next one comes along and does the same thing. And these dendrites, because zinc plates really, really easily, tend to form like this, um, especially if you have lower concentrations of zinc, so late in the batteries just charge, or, charge, um, or if you're running at high currents. And here's another picture. This is from an alkali uh, um, acidic system where you can see a really bad case of dendrites. <clears throat> People have used all sorts of different additives in the past, um, but they haven't been designed. You can see, like I mentioned before, the PEI or PEG kind of, kind of additives. 
he represented as these little red squiggles. People have used these sorts of things in the past, and they can't help stop dendrites, but they're not designer. You know, they don't do anything special except they stick to zinc. So you get a very blunt suppression of, of zinc deposition across the surface. So while they do stop your dendrite growth, they also slow down growth in other places too. So you can see here an example of that. You can get a relatively smooth dendrite free uh, zinc surface, but it's also relatively thin. You know, you've lost some of that capacity, you've lost some of that efficiency, um, a sacrifice to using an additive like this. But then if you use our additive, Octolite, this is where we apply our novel use. You know, we, we have designed the chemistry, we've discovered specific structures in our molecules through iteration at the molecular level to find the certain moieties that are attracted to dendrite tips, but not the regular surface. So we can block only the places where it's problematic, dendrite forming uh, nuclei tips here, but not the places where we want the zinc to go down. So the end result is a smooth, but also a thick deposit of zinc. You keep your efficiency, but you also stop dendrite growth. So it's a solution that allows our customers to increase performance without the sacrifices that other additives would bring or other kinds of solutions. So a little bit science-y. <laughs> so if we can compare it to other kinds of solutions, people have tried other things before. And if you read anything about batteries, you'll read about dendrites and you'll read about people who have solved the dendrite problem. It's, it's in the news even today. But what that really means is they found a way around the dendrites. Um, a lot of times they'll use a shaped anode that internalizes or absorbs the dendrites. They might mix in other metals to the anode or even into the electrolyte. And those will stop dendrites within certain ranges of operation for the battery. Um, but they also don't work throughout charge. They have drawbacks associated with cost. They can affect the electronics of the battery. Um, you know, in the cases of like shape anodes, you have to design the battery around them in many ways. And of course, people have tried old additives too. Like I mentioned, um, you know, the things that were not designed for zinc batteries. So they all have their own pluses and minuses. Um, they stop dendrites, but it always comes at some sort of cost, efficiency, um, design cost. Octolite, unlike all of those, stops dendrites, but also improves safety. Um, prevents hydrogen formation, works throughout charge, maintains efficiency. It does all these great things with no drawbacks. And possibly the best thing of all is it plays with all the other solutions too. If you have some sort of special shaped anode, say a special porous zinc or tiered sort of anode structure that really internalizes the dendrites or makes them less damaging, octolite can, can work with that. You know, you mix this into the electrolyte and uh, they work in tandem to make the battery even better. It's a really effortless solution uh, for our customers that we think provides the most effective way to stop dendrites. So that's kind of a quick rundown of what our what our pitch decks look like these days. Um, our product is the chemical, our customers are the zinc battery manufacturers, and so we're kind of doubly bought into the idea of zinc batteries being the best battery for the grid and stationary storage and our green energy future. Um, and also that Octolite our, our products are what are going to get them there and help them be competitive against incumbent technologies that are misaligned but very, very popular. So who's making zinc batteries? This is a cross-section of a number of companies who are doing, have done, or have some interest in zinc. A lot of names you probably don't know, probably some you do, like Duracell, Panasonic, Energizer, making your AA, AAA batteries. Uh, the list is growing, so we're pretty excited about this. They're not all doing grid storage. Some of them are doing stationary power, um, uh, uh, quite a variety of different things, uh, military batteries. But they're all looking at zinc because of all the advantages I mentioned before. And without naming specific names, we're working with most of the names you see on this page uh, to help support their zinc efforts. <clears throat> you need to have, as I mentioned before, you know, how are you going to make a business out of this? And we believe there's a big addressable market um, between grid storage, alkaline zinc, lead acid replacement. Uh, these are big markets. And in case of grid storage growing even bigger, coming up without really a true incumbent technology, uh, we believe there could be uh, opportunity just for the chemicals that support these large, large battery markets. Could you be easily be into the billions of dollars? You know, zinc can grow to capture large, large amounts of the markets that it's going after or is already in like alkaline zinc. 
So we think there's a real opportunity for additives like ours to improve these batteries and build a company up like Octet into uh, an expert at designing and providing additives to improve performance for zinc-based batteries. So I want to talk a little bit about funding. And this is kind of the first level of you know, when you get serious with your company idea. And a great place to start at the very early level. I mean, there's there's the weekend warrior sort of, you know, playing out with an idea in your spare time, you know, which is generally you know, cost free unless you're trying to do some actual chemistry and don't have access to a chemistry lab. But there are great ways to get started at a, at a low level. And one of them is the, the i -Corps program. So uh, the National Science Foundation administers the i -Corps program, which is essentially that customer discovery I talked about before. You think you have an idea, um, and maybe you have a technology that supports that idea, but you really need to know who's going to pay for this. You know, who, who would, do people actually want this? Is there a problem I can solve with this technology or idea? And what the i -Corps program does with you is kind of coach you through a way to um, you know, test out that idea. They'll often help you put together a team or at least encourage you to build a team and start conducting interviews with these customers. And that can be a bit daunting if you've never worked in an industry before or maybe are, are young just in your career to just kind of cold call companies and say, Hey, I'm interested in, in your battery technology and can we talk sometime? You probably you may not get a response. But iCore will coach you into how to seek the pain points in different industries to see where they're really feeling the need for something new. And when you're working with iCore, uh, then you know you can always say, hey, I'm, I'm with the NSF iCore, important names, take me seriously, kind of stuff in your, in your communication. And I looked it up to see which i sites programs are nearest to you um, in Eau Claire. And it's probably University of Minnesota. But if you want to stay in state, uh, UW-Milwaukee has a program. There are many of them. I think they're probably all run a little bit differently. We did one through Akron uh, last summer, um, University of Akron. And so I encourage you to look into them. And like I said before, you know, be, be, be not shy, <laughs> be shameless about trying to get in touch with people. They, they, these organizations are designed to help cultivate good ideas and help you prove out whether or not someone's gonna wanna pay for this idea. You know, it, it, would say, it saves everyone time to, uh, if, you have, if you have an idea that's not gonna work, you know, they'll learn that as soon as possible. And once you, once you kind of get past that barrier, you can say, hey, we did the i program. I've got this data to show you that the X and Y industry is, is desperate for a solution to this, and we have it. Or this, you know, they would they would spend they would spend money on this, or you know, we and with our idea, it adds a lot of credence to your 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 great idea. Um, we raise money also through the the actual SBIR STTR program through two different phase ones. Um, right now, we're at the second part of our um, second phase one, and so we'll be applying for phase two very soon in a few months. And we've also raised some money from the Innovation Fund of Northeast Ohio. So, you know, look into your state's programs. This one is from Ohio Third Frontier. Every state has their own small business supporting kind of um, uh, programs. Look for grant funding. You know, it, it's costly to start a science company that has a physical product. And so you'll definitely need funding. And these are just some of the avenues to go after. Um, we've been able to build out our team, which is also a really critical part of any company. This is what a lot of the money goes toward. Um, I won't run through all this detail, but we've been able to add Emily Dickens. Uh, she came to us from Case Western Reserve. She was an intern for a time here and then joined full time when we started our phase one. And recently from our state funding, we could add Brian Iser, um, our, our head of business development, uh, to help us with our customer outreach, marketing, business building, you know, having an MBA in the room with our scientists. Uh, so you'll definitely need help. So. That is a real quick rundown. I'm looking at the clock and I see you're going a little long here. So um, the last thing I wanted to say was uh, how to succeed in life. I said I would, I would throw this little nugget in there. It's pretty simple. I like to say, you know, make friends with people, you know, and I mean professional friends. Um, in your professional circles, you know, be, be valuable. Like if you're, if you're on a team, if you're a student, you know, help the people around you. 
be be someone who's helpful and valuable, be reliable, you know, be genuine. I say make friends and I don't mean, you know, shake hands and smile and kiss babies and stuff. I mean like just just be the best person you can be, you know, and don't be shy to reach out, be friendly, meet new people, see what their challenges are, see if there's someone you can help them. Don't be shy. You know, I, I used to kind of get caught up in that, you know, who am I? What can I do for you? Like, you know, I didn't feel like I was, you know, valuable enough to make these kinds of connections. But, you know, don't worry about that. You know, when you're looking for a job, when you're looking for a situation, you know, be be someone you would want to work with. You know, that means being being friendly, being supportive, being, you know, uh, a team player, to use, use a cliche. And also, going back in time, someone asked me in the, the, the session before the talk, um, you know, what would I change, you know, if I go back? And I would have a different opinion about networking. Like when I was young, I thought networking was this kind of not what you know, who's you know kind of game that seemed distasteful to me, but it's really not. You know, it's really just people trying to help each other find the right position, find the right place, find ways to synergize with each other. And, you know, it's advertising. It's, it's showing the world what you can do. Um, it's finding out what the world needs done, you know, and just kind of getting out there. So um, definitely embrace it. Meet people, make friends. You know, I, I put con con convince, don't manipulate. You know, you want to, even with the start, if you have a good idea, you have to convince yourself. You, know, you, have, to be, you have to be honest. You have to say, okay, is this really a good idea? You know, convince yourself first. And if you can really convince yourself, then you can convince others because because you you're, you're bought into the idea. You're not trying to manipulate or trick people or do some sort of Machiavellian crap. You know, um, be genuine. You know, be honest. You know, and make as many friends as you can. I think that's the end of the show. <laughs> okay, with that. Um... Thank you so much. This is a great talk. Uh, we can turn it over to our Q&A session. Uh, I have a question if nobody else wants to start. Um, so when you were talking about uh, like zinc batteries, kind of like X or Energizer and Duracell and how they're non-rechargeable. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if like your kids or anything play video games, but like how you can buy console controllers that are rechargeable. Are those non-zinc batteries then? Yes. Um, a lot of times those would be like nickel cadmium or they sometimes, you know, now there's even some like lithium, like they'll have lithium brands. You know, you don't really notice it because they're always in the, the same cell size. Yeah. But if they're rechargeable, they're probably a nickel cadmium, which is not, not a very large amount of the actual battery market. But, and I mean, how many times can you really recharge those? You know, I mean, I've used them in the past. And I feel like, I don't know. I, I didn't stress, I didn't tax them as much as you might with a controller, but like in a remote control for a TV or something. I mean, you recharge them maybe 20, maybe 50 times, and then they they fade. You know, they're not, they're not really the kind of batteries for, you know, recharge every day. So to answer your question shortly, no, those are not zinc. Those are some other chemistry inside. Um, I don't think anyone right now, well, aside from the companies we're talking about, like there's not any sort of long-standing rechargeable zinc um, in the market, aside from the ones that are that are taking shape right now from our customer base. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have a question. Um, you know, like the uh, actolite um, is falling on top of the surface of the metal zinc. Is there, is there a unique property, unique structure of the, I, I would call it the, the mountain on the surface where the uh, the actolite falls on it, it just stays and blocks the uh, growth of the dendrite. Is, there, uh, is that a very, very special molecule sticking to that or what? Um, I don't believe so, but we don't really know. Um, you know that's, that's a very simplified kind of view of it. You know, it's generally seen as a nucleation site where it starts to grow and then you have this kind of run away because of the, you know, there, there's a lot of different theories about it. But what we do speculate anyway, is that it's some sort of tip-like shape. And so it has a very strong electric field because you have, you have the same sort of charge, you know, uniform throughout the metal, you assume. And at the tip, you have a much smaller area. 
So you have a stronger field. Um, so we believe that also contributes to the attraction of the ions there. Um, and what we've discovered with our additives are a balancing of very strongly attracted chemical structure um, and very weakly attracted. You know, so we found a, a special kind of functional, it's bigger than a functional group, but you know, it's like that, like a certain chemical structure that is attracted to those tips but doesn't seem to impede the smooth plating, we should say. Mm, so okay. it's, it's kind of a balancing of those forces. We don't believe there's anything special about the shape of the tip other than it's some sort of a tip. You know, so you have a stronger field and it stands taller than the rest. You know, imagine the flat surface where you've got the, the diffusional, you know, half of the space is solvent and half of the space is metal. But if you have a tip, you know, it's almost like 100% of the space is solvent. You know, it increases the, the potential for diffusional access uh, from the ion. So that's the best we know. Though I'll tell you very yeah. honestly, yeah. there's a lot we don't know happening at okay. that low level. It's difficult to, difficult to observe in, in situ. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just had a question. I might I might have missed this, but uh, I was just curious on what was the scale of your zinc experiment? What scale was that on? Um, you mean like the pictures? Yeah, like how? Yeah, what? How big are those? Um, like this. Let's see. This is about a three mil. This is a, a three millimeter diameter. This is a glassy. This is a glassy carbon um, electrode, pretty common. So we just plated the zinc on top of that. It's it's about three millimeters in diameter. Okay. I think I think some of the earlier pictures. I think this one is just a one millimeter. This is a z one millimeter zinc wire, a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. you know, our customers work on larger scale, obviously. Yeah. We do we do a lot of screening. You know, so we modify a chemical, do a dendrite test. You know, modify the chemical, do a dendrite test. So we we try to we have a lot of throughput. So we do a lot of testing with small, smaller scale to see how things look. And then we send samples to the customers. So the customers are the ones who have centimeters and larger plates that they, they are actually depositing. So we can see that it scales with size. Uh, these are all just relatively small since these are trusted. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, for you, what would be like the dream outcome for your business? You mean the exit strategy? We say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, our plan, the, the goal of the company is to become a chemical manufacturer. Um, you know, there's, there's a few different paths you see a lot of technical companies go. You know, a lot of times people talk about licensing. And if you just want to do the research, develop a, develop a process, some IP, and then sell the IP to someone who's actually going to do it. That's one thing. We believe um, that chemical production for these could be could be very profitable for a business. My background working in specialty chemicals, uh, you know, kind of suggests that to be the case. So we plan to be a manufacturer. You know, one of the good things about doing additives are that they're a very small add to the battery. So if we wanted, to, and I say that meaning one percent. We have we have some customers who are experimenting with like a thousand, you know, like hundred ppm concentrations of the additive in their electrolyte. So very small volume, very manageable volume for us. So as we as we grow, we don't need to build a plant, uh, you know, right away. We can keep our capital cost relatively low by using a toll manufacturer. Um, our compounds are designed to be scalable. Um, they're not complex, um, not multi-step synthesis. Um, so we think it will be easy to become a manufacturing company um, relative to some of the larger plays with uh, chemical development. So we hope to get to that stage and then where it goes from there is a question. I mean, depending on how big things get, which depends a lot on how well zinc does, um, we could be acquired by a larger chemical company. Um, we're certainly talking to them already to see if there's interest uh, for investment. Um, or we could grow to be a standalone company. I mean, if we can reach those billion dollar opportunities, I mean, it's, it's possible this could be, or even quite a bit less than that. We could just operate as a standalone company. It's kind of all on the table right now, though we're definitely leaning more towards manufacturer than um, licensing. Um, 
I guess again for a question. So you're talking about the the really bad dendrite growth and all that stuff, but um, how how fast do the dendrites grow? Like I think you talked about kind of cycles or something like that. Is that like trials or like how often electric current is passed through it? Well, you know, it really depends. You know, batteries you can you can make dendrites grow. You know, if you the dendrites grow in the battery's charging, so you're depositing the zinc, and if you run at a really high voltage, which basically means you're running, you know, you're, you're pushing the current, you're you're moving the zinc really fast, you can grow the dendrites faster, bigger. You know, you can you can kind of turn the knobs on the machine and control how hard or not the dendrites grow, but the batteries, you know, what our customers do, they have a battery that's designed to operate at a certain voltage, at a certain current density, you know, and they, they can't really turn those knobs in the battery. And what we do with tests like you, you see here, we kind of, we like to grow the dendrites in a more a rougher condition. We'll often turn up the voltage a little bit, you know, to make sure the dendrites are definitely growing in our control case. And, I mean, it depends a lot on the chemistry too. Right here, this is an alkaline system, so um, zinc oxide, KOH, very standard kind of basic alkaline battery system. And this is showing dendrite growth over 25 minutes at current densities that are relatively low. Um, this guy is only about a nine minute deposition, but this is an entirely different chemistry. So this is an acidic zinc bromine chemistry. Um, you know, so it, you know, it really depends. And for a lot of our customers' batteries, they're already trying to commercialize some sort of battery. So the dendrite growth isn't this bad in any one cycle. A cycle is basically you drain the battery, you charge the battery. That's one cycle. So batteries need to last for thousands of cycles in most applications. So you might not get a crazy puffball of dendrites like this after one cycle. What happens is after 100 cycles, you have some some bad shape. You have you have some maybe some dendrites growing, some tips, some pieces are broken off. You know, it, it's not as dramatic as this. They're looking to get from 500 cycles to 1,000 cycles, 1,000 cycles to 2,000 cycles by making sure these never form. So in our case, we're showing them. Okay, we've we've run a control test where dendrites are out of control, like it's crazy. Look at all these dendrites, and in those same conditions now, we just add one percent of our added to the solution. And the same condition which led to that out of control dendrite growth now is totally smooth. You know, and we have a nice shiny cake of zinc forming. You know, and that's how we kind of impress our customers because we can't really make one of their batteries in house. You know, we can't recreate their batteries. There's, there's proprietary stuff, there's customers' trade secrets. So we kind of show them the extreme case to say, look, you know, look how, look how good our additives are. We, we shut the dendrites off even in these harsh conditions. So it all varies. I mean, we can we can grow them a lot faster if we want to. We do want to demonstrate that we can we can stop them in any case though. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll echo again. This was a fantastic talk. Great questions, everybody. For the sake of time, we will cut the QA short, but you know you can all find Onus on LinkedIn and you can reach out to him. He's been very accommodating with uh, our students' communications. So let's all thank Onus for his time. Awesome. <laughs> all right, so um, we have another talk next week. We have uh, Dr. Luke Roberson coming in from NASA. So stay tuned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.